Press stop. With Brad Restituto. Comes up to the pocket. He fires the right side. Caught by Diggs. Stay oh, my God. Oh, my God. Welcome to the rest stop. We're live in Las Vegas here on a Tuesday, September 1st. I'm Brad Restituto, as you can see right there. And Spencer the Wiz is with me today. And we got a good show for you today. We're going to hit uh, definitely some sports as the NBA playoffs are in full effect. Uh, NFL is about two weeks away. So we're going to hit a little NFL action. We're going to bring a segment to you today called Confessions. Confessions from the Believer, Brad the Believer. So make sure you stay tuned. Uh, that should be coming up in about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so that'll be good. We got a good one for you today. I'm uh, going to start off with uh, we, we didn't see you since Thursday, so we had the whole weekend and now on Tuesday, and quite a bit has happened since uh, we saw you last, especially on my end. As on Friday, I was playing basketball in the morning, and uh, I've been playing on kind of a sore foot, and uh, I just kept playing through it, didn't really listen to my body. I, I kind of turned an ankle a little over a month ago, but the ankle didn't quite turn. I fell kind of on the side of my foot. It's been bothering me for months, but it, it went to a head on Friday as I completely collapsed on the court and I uh, got x-rays and it's a fracture of my fifth metatarsal in my foot. So uh, I'll show you the crutches as I've got the crutches here uh, to get me around the apartment. And also uh, I've got my knee scooter that I got in today thanks to the Tominator who uh, hooked me up with that, and I got to use that for the first time today. So the knee scooter got me around pretty well. Uh, so it's 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 pretty it's it's definitely a bummer. Me and Spence love to play basketball, and uh, I've got at least a good eight weeks of no basketball, Spence. Uh, as I saw a uh, second doctor today, uh, Doctor Single, here in Las Vegas, and uh, he said he'll come back for a re X ray in eight weeks. Uh, but no basketball for me, my man. I'm very upset about that. Uh, and I'm going to have to find a way to uh, get my exercise in without basketball with this foot fracture. Uh, it's the worst. I can tell you in high school, I had a Jones fracture. And the way I got it was my mom wanted to do a half marathon with me. And I didn't know that until a week before the race. So when I did the half marathon, I completed it. It was my second one at the time. And uh, yeah, I broke my foot in the middle of it. And I didn't realize until the next day when I couldn't walk. It sucks. Uh, I've been very bummed and I've, I've been bedridden since Friday, Spence. And I didn't get my crutches till today, I believe, in my scooter. So I've been crawling around on my hands and knees in my apartment to get to the fridge. I hop on one foot to get to the bathroom. Uh, I have gotten to my car. I hop on one foot to get there. Uh, luckily, I can use my toe on my because the fracture is down towards my uh, the right side of my foot. So my big toe is still good. Uh, so I've been bedridden. So I've had to find a way to entertain myself. I did some net, Netflix binge watching over the weekend and I found something that I kind of uh, fell in love with over the weekend, Cobra Kai on Netflix, Spence, which is kind of a runoff of the 80s movie Karate Kid. I'm an 80s child, love the 80s. It's my favorite decade. I love 80s music, 80s movies, my absolute favorite. And I thought they hit a home run with Cobra Kai. They really brought the Johnny Lawrence character to life. Uh, they they also have uh, Daniel LaRusso, who is Ralph Macchio in there, and he has a family and is married at this point in time. They've done a great job. Fell in love with Cobra Kai over the weekend as I fractured my foot on Friday, bedridden for the weekend, found Cobra Kai, and I went through uh, both seasons. They just came out with season two. So 30 minutes an episode. I got five hours in very quickly, and uh, I'm in love with it, man, and I was disappointed that it ended. I'm ready for season three. Season two kind of ended on a cliffhanger. I won't spoil it for anybody that hasn't watched it, but if you like the 80s at all and you're a Karate Kid fan, I highly recommend uh, Cobra Kai. And I'm excited now for season three, but they tell I I'm reading online, not till 2021. Spence, have you seen The Karate Kid? 
I have seen the Karate Kid. I'm a very old soul. I'm, I'm very much into retro uh, type of stuff. I have a bunch of retro consoles. I have an Atari 2600. So it may not be as personal to me as it is to you because you grew, grew up with it. I, I am very familiar with the uh, source material. And I thought I think the show is really good. I, I think it's much better than like Karate Kid 3 or 4, which I think uh, came out. I've only seen like once and they were terrible. So it uh, proves that you shouldn't rush, uh, you know, third and fourth movies although the only one who did it right was rocky three and four were fantastic but in terms of all the other franchises from that time uh this is definitely the best way to kind of bring it back into the fold i would say yeah rocky crushed it and uh so i'm a big 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 proponent big thumbs up for cobra kai uh some of my friends and family are suggesting ozark is the way to go for my next binge watching so i may start that tonight and see how much i can get in um Tomorrow's Wednesday. I don't know. Uh, since since I'm incapacitated with this injury, I don't have many plans up until Friday when my girlfriend gets back to town. I'm very excited about that. Um, so I'll I'll find a way to wheel myself in my knee knee scooter to the airport to pick her up. Uh, but until then, it's pretty much just uh, find a way to maneuver my newfound uh, disability around the apartment. So uh, I may get into Ozark tonight. Uh, we had some great basketball tonight but that's over for the evening we'll get into that a little bit later so if you have any good suggestions suggestions spence throw them my way and any of the listeners out there uh, on facebook on landry twitch if you have any great netflix suggestions like i said i love the 80s so if you want to gear them towards anything in the 80s i'm all for that so uh, you can follow us on twitter i'm at brad the believer spencer is at spencer the whiz and of course brad the believer on instagram and you can catch us What's up, AK? Adam Joseph, what's up, my man? Uh, Adam Joseph here in Las Vegas from Opportunity Village checking in. What's up, my man? Uh, but yeah, uh, anytime uh, you can catch us here live Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, 9 to 10 o'clock here on Landry Twitch. You can go www.twitch.tv slash Chris Landry Football and make sure you check out any of the podcasts. If you missed us live, you can go to any of the streaming podcast platform and search Landry football conference call, and then just search for the rest stop and you can find us there also. So uh, I want to kind of recap what we hit on just for, just for about 10, 10, 11 minutes here on Thursday. Um, because I, I had some feedbacks and some of my DMS and, and some people reached out to me about the conversation we had. We hit a lot of the civil unrest and social justice going on. Um, but, but one of my old friends reached out to me. We had a couple hour conversation on the phone about, uh, some of the stuff that's going on and how some of that impacted this person's life uh, directly as far as her family's involvement with police. Uh, and it's it really was a reflecting moment for me. And I just want to kind of share my uh, personal <laughs> beliefs. Nick Nice, sorry. Nick Nice is in the house. Yes, Nick Nice, you are, uh, you can, your voice is a part of the show. You you killed it. I love you, man. And thanks for, uh, for tuning in. But Last Thursday, we got into some of the civil unrest and a close friend of mine from years ago reached out to me and had some discussion uh, about how that impacted their life personally. And, and it made me reflect a little bit. And I know everybody has a different perspective on how they handle tragedy and, and um, loss and, and things that hit very close to home. And it's easy for us to, to formulate an opinion uh, about something from an outsider's perspective or, or uh, on the outside looking in. Uh, all, all I can say for myself is uh, I, I can easily correlate everything that's happened into my life very quickly to a decision that I've made and how that decision has led me to where I'm at. Um, perfect example. I mean, I could easily take this little foot injury and say, oh, well, the timing's bad. Uh, why is this happening to me? I know this is a small little thing, but uh, I can easily answer that. It happened because I didn't listen to my body. I was playing on a foot that was hurt for over a month and I didn't give it the proper time to heal and I overdid it. And next thing you know, I got a foot fracture. Um, I, I know some, some of those things aren't easy to quantify when tragedy or, or loss happens, especially when somebody loses their life. Um, but, but life is a series of decisions and a series of uh, syncretic events that happen, and it really can be correlated to the decisions we make. So a, a lot of my big message in saying this is, is really personal accountability. It's really easy for, for a lot of us to kind of point the finger at things that are out of our control and say, well, you know, well, well, politics did this or society is doing that. 
but what is the role that we play personally in our accountability to to where we're at today and, and the situations and circumstances surrounding us? Uh, and I know it's not easy for everybody to do. And I, and I can't say that just because this is something that I try to do, that it's everybody should do it and easily do it. I just challenge anybody out there that is maybe having some questions. Uh, look, I have questions all the time and it's tough. It's tough to navigate through the stuff. Uh, as I was talking to Spence yesterday on the phone, um, I try to prepare myself for the worst and of course, you know, hope for the best, but that's a reality. I mean, I can wake up tomorrow and this has happened, not exactly in this order, but your car cannot start. You can be fired from your job. Uh, you know, one of your loved ones can be sick. All of this can happen like a series of dominoes all in one sitting. And it, those situations suck, but how we handle and how we react to those situations are really going to define how we navigate through this life and, and how our outlook and our our kind of mindset and mood is. Um, there's always little things we can all do to enhance our mood, whether it's uh, through exercise or, or meditation or what have you. But, um, you know, there's there's sometimes questions out there. And, and I know it's kind of a, a a religious type saying, but you know, the, the old serenity prayer, God gr grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can't and the wisdom to know the difference. And I know sometimes in, in catastrophic situations, um, sometimes people blame God or, or they uh, kind of outwardly ask why. And uh, I've, I've just personally in my own life, never wanted to take that approach and, and just always think about um, how I can impact my current situation. And, um, it, it's, it's tough to navigate through these times. We're in such a divisive area in politics. Everybody's on each side of the spectrum. And so many people love to finger point. They love to, to point the finger instead of really taking a good look in the mirror and, and worrying about how they can control their own situation. And it really kind of frustrates me in my own community. I, I hear other radio personalities and, and talents sometimes, uh, you know, kind of wag the finger in social justice angst about what's going on in society. But some of these same people won't even lend a hand to the people that they work with side by side every day that really could use their help, whether you're talking about minorities or anybody else. So I get frustrated when you're not even willing to help somebody in your own workplace or your own household that you're clamoring for justice outwardly of people you've never met in different states. So, um, you know, I just, it's just kind of a, a reflective time and a, and a challenge to arms for people to um, just kind of, you know, take accountability and find forgiveness at times. It's, I know it's a challenge and Spence, I know you, I want you to speak to this and I know I'm kind of going a little long with this, but it's really important to me um, that, that we can all kind of, you know, not only find a little bit of self accountability, but forgiveness in there also. I know that there's been people, places, things, and events that have sometimes uh, really carved us up on the inside, and it's hard to forgive and it's hard to to move on and kind of have that release. But um, it, it's it's not really going to do us a whole lot of, of benefit to continue to live in the rearview mirror. And I know we do that sometimes with the civil unrest, as we we like to kind of. Uh, focus on the past. And I'm not saying that the past isn't an pr uh, important predictor of sometimes future behavior, uh, but I think we all want to kind of move towards being more united than divisive. And in order to do that, we got to continue to look look forward. Uh, Spence, I want you to jump in here and give me some of your thoughts. Yeah, we've talked about this a lot personally in our little personal discussions, like the power of forgiveness, which is just unparalleled, even when you shouldn't give someone forgiveness. And Forgiveness doesn't have to necessarily be that you forget the past and you just say it's fine. It's about coming with that inner peace, like coming to terms with that emotion that you feel about that event. And it's about removing yourself from that situation and being like, I understand what happened, but I release those feelings from that situation because all it does is incite hate. And I've seen this on both sides of the spectrum. I've seen people be excited when someone gets killed. Um, you know, when they're rioting and they got shot. So when people like, oh, it's, it's what they deserve. And on the, equally on the other side, which upsets me, uh, in, they think the, both sides think they're so different, but in, in a lot, they have a lot similar. Someone say, oh, I hope he gets the virus and dies. To me, those are two of the same exact things. And a lot of that comes from revenge and the inability to come to the table. There are people who refuse to talk to somebody because of their beliefs. And I don't understand how anything could ever get done until it happens. And in order for that to happen, people are going to have to make tremendous, tremendous personal sacrifices and release those feelings. And like I said, I don't think anything gets done until that happens. 
Yeah, good good thoughts there, Spence. And uh, we're going to move on from that uh, because I didn't want to spend too much time, but I did want to reflect on that a little bit. Spence, uh, if you can get it ready, I want to go to one of our new segments here. So if you're listening, stay tuned right now. We're going to get to Confessions, Confessions of the Believer. Hit it, Spence. Great job there, Spence. <laughs> All right, so I have a confession to make, Spence. Okay, I'm ready. I am registered to vote. Here's the confession, but I've never voted ever. I, I am on the upside of my 30s and have never voted once. I realized over the weekend I am registered to vote and I plan on voting this year, but I have some questions for you. Okay. okay. So for anybody that's just joining us, we just started off. Spence had a great bite with uh, the Believer Confession. My confession is I've never voted ever once, but I'm going to change that this year. I plan to vote, but I have some questions for Spencer the Wiz. And Spence, my first question is, so I'm very disgruntled with the, the House and the Senate. They're on vacation for 21 days here when they're supposed to be uh, voting on a second stimulus package. Is these, the American people are panicking. We have no money. We can't pay our bills. We don't have jobs to go back to. Getting evicted from our houses. So when I go to vote this year on my ballot, are there specific senators like this uh, Mitch McConnell I keep hearing about, this jabroni, and uh, Speaker Pelosi, do I get to vote them out? Are there names on the ballot where I get to say, no, I don't want you in? Explain to me how this works, Spence. If I want to vote on the Congress and Senate, how am I able to vote? Because I've never done this before. Uh, no, you cannot vote out of state. So we, we have our senator in House elections. So unfortunately, we can't vote on people that we just really don't like from other states uh just to give fair representation i suppose because otherwise it's hard enough to get people to vote for their own elections and then we're going to start involving them in like other cities it just it doesn't work out that way but on the ballot you will see a bunch of uh important questions that relate to nevada which i personally believe are even more important than who we vote into senate uh, which I know is a bold statement, but those these little things that you'll see, these questions, and you'll start seeing like propaganda on both sides of whether you, on what side you should vote on. But they're really important issues. Like the last time I voted, it was about uh, whether or not we would have to convert to at least fifty percent uh, relying on renewable resources by like twenty thirty. So uh, I would definitely pay close attention to those. Well, Spence, once I have you here live, uh, we'll go over some of this more, and I'm glad you've. Uh, educated me on this. And I know if my good friend Tracy Rose is listening, you could see her comment. She has Bernie Sanders as her icon. She's very passionate about her politics. So so this one's kind of for her. Hopefully she's not too upset the fact I've never voted, but I am registered and I will vote this year. And Spence will kind of be my sensei as I navigate through this experience and realize what it is to vote, how I can vote and what I can vote on and what I should be, <laughs> what I should be passionate about. As uh, Tracy says, ditch Mitch. As uh, if I had my way, we would be ditching a lot, a lot of these guys out of their positions. They're, they, they, they're, they should be fortunate that honestly, with, uh, <laughs> with, with, the fact that they're even able to go to sleep at night because they're they're absolutely frustrating the American people with their three week vacation that they're still not going to be back from for another week. So look, we we've hit our political spectrum for the night. Unless you have anything else that you're very passionate to talk about, please comment in the comment section and we'll get to your question if you have anything you want to discuss on the political spectrum. But we're three weeks away from the start of the NFL season. September 14th, NFL is ready to kick off, Spence, and it's going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers and the New York Giants and then the Tennessee Titans and the Denver Broncos, I believe, is the second matchup. So we're only two weeks away, the, the first in, in recent memory with NFL with no preseason. Uh, this, of course, pandemic-filled 2020 has completely turned the sports world upside down. But we will have NFL football. Some teams will have limited capacities in, with fans. Us here in Las Vegas with our first inaugural season of the Las Vegas Wave.
Uh, sorry, I think uh, Brad's audio cut out uh, for a moment. So while he uh, fixes his microphone, uh, I will start to go over what we were just talking about. So, uh, so yeah, obviously football is coming back, and the first game is going to be the Steelers. And I'll be Brad for a moment. <laughs> so when he comes back, we'll be able to hear him, and I'll, I'll introduce him back into the stream. It's going to be ugly. Uh, Daniel Jones has honestly not been looking great in training camp, so that's part of the problem here. Yeah, sorry, Tominator. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, the Steelers are probably... That's honestly a really bad opening game, in my opinion, but uh, I do understand that the Steelers are definitely a national team. Uh, other than that, and I know Brad will talk about it as soon as he comes back, we're going to talk about the Jaguars trade to the Vikings, which I believe was for a second-round pick for definitely one of the best defensive ends in the league. And I think a lot of the problem comes in in that he still has a year left on his contract. So I don't think he's able to be renewed this year. So the real issue will come in uh, once, uh, you know, once the offseason comes in. If you wasted a second, I don't know. I mean, the idea is that wasting a second round pick for one of the best defensive end, if you only get him for a year, is that worth it? I don't know. How many second round picks in reality? Uh, you know, make a, a huge splash and a, a big difference on the field. I really don't know. Uh, not not a lot, <laughs> at least from a Raiders fan perspective. The second round has not been too kind. You know, you have Derek Carr and stuff like that. But let's see if we can get Brad in, hopefully. Am I back? You are back. Okay, perfect. Oh, God. Sorry about that uh, with the uh, cutout there. But look, we, we were getting into NFL. Hopefully, we can seamlessly transition back into that. But I heard you spend talking about uh, some of the transactions here over the weekend. Uh, Yannick and Dockway, the Vikings traded a second round and a fifth round pick that could turn into a potential third round pick for uh, Dockway to tandem with Daniil Hunter on the end and really give the Vikings a strong pass rush. Uh, which they already have, and they've got some really all-star linebackers, and they're just hoping that their young secondary uh, can step up and, and play well. Uh, so it was a big get for them. And then the Jaguars also released uh, running back Leonard Fournette today, LS, former LSU star, uh, has rushed for over 1,000 yards, and has been pretty solid for Jacksonville, but they decided to move on in a position that's kind of uh, expendable in this, this NFL, this day and age. We talked about before we went on, is this the Jaguars' start for um, – <laughs> kind of positioning themselves for Trevor Lawrence. You thought that that was a, a very much a possibility, and I agree with you. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And uh, Leonard Fournette has a ton of off-field problems in terms of his aggression and the way he, he treats his teammates. So this was honestly a thing that was long time coming. He's really good. I think he's like first in yards after contact or third, something like that. So his stats are always going to be good. But, you know, his ability to stay on the field is where the real problem comes in, like his off the field antics are what's going to keep him off the field, not injuries. Although he has had his own slew of injuries as well. Uh, so the Tominator's chiming in. He wants to know if we have any predictions for the teams that may go to the Super Bowl, or, and how do you feel Brady will do in Tampa? Well, I'll start off with the Brady question. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of Brady in Tampa. I, I just have always, at least the last decade, I'm a fan of not only the underdog but a guy that can absolutely excel in the underdog role and Tom Brady is the epitome of that a guy that's continuing to play at a high level uh, past his 40s I know statistically some people may feel like he's not uh, at the level he was once was but he's got a lot of weapons here in Tampa with Mike Evans Godwin uh, two really good tight ends with Gronkowski and OJ Howard and I, I like the fact that he's got an offensive coach it's really the first head coach he's had uh, he's only had one other one in Belichick, but uh, an offensively driven quarterback. I think Tampa's going to do very well with Brady under center. I know it's a tough division uh, out there in the NFC South, um, but I, I, I believe that Tampa Bay is going to go to the playoffs, and I think they've got a chance to make some noise. Spence, your thoughts on Tom Brady in Tampa? <laughs> yeah, I last season I called Brady Noodle Arm Brady the whole season. <laughs> so Peter. that's. Yeah, I, I actually photoshopped like Rigatoni uh, for his arms at some point in the season. But I think a lot of that comes from, you know, the, the team that was around him. 
you know, they put a lot of stock in this like first round pick that they had last year. And I feel like that's never a good idea, especially when he's not one of coveted as one of the top three guys that you kind of expect to get production. Even then the most productive rookies, like getting a thousand yards is a really big deal. And ideally, you know, on any team structure, you have a receiver that, you know, can get you a thousand yards on any season. So he has two of those guys on his team and also just happens to have Rob Gronkowski to go along with a young tight end that's been disappointing thus far in his career from Alabama. But, you know, we, we know what Brady can do with two tight end sets. Yeah, I, I think Tampa Bay is going to be dynamic. Brady is uh, he's the ultimate pro working out with these guys right away in the offseason. I think you can't underestimate him, and especially his first year with a new team. I think they're going to do very well. I, I predict 10 plus wins. Uh, for Tampa Bay, and I feel like they've got a really uh, a good chance to make some noise. As far as Super Bowl predictions, it's really tough to say at this point. I definitely think Kansas City's uh, favorite from the AFC side if they stay healthy. NFC is kind of a crapshoot, man. You're going to have a competitive uh, New Orleans team. Um, look, San Francisco is going to be stronger, uh, if not just as strong as last year when they represented the NFC in the Super Bowl. Um, so they're going to be a tough out. Um, and Tampa Bay, we, we just talked about them. There's those are three teams right off the bat that are going to be in the mix for a playoff spot. And then you got division winners from the NFC East, which should either be the Cowboys or the Eagles, and then the North, uh, either the Packers or the Vikings, you would think. But you got a Bears team that's going to be competitive, also, um, and a Lions team that has underachieved, but I think they're going to be competitive in that division as well. So it's going to be uh, tough in the NFC to predict. I think the Rams, the LA Rams, may bounce back and have a better year than they did last year. So, Spence, any thoughts on uh, the NFC, how that shapes out? And, and I would imagine you would agree that Kansas City's probably the prohibited favorite in the AFC to represent in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, they have to be, right? <laughs> you have the best quarterback in the league, like, pretty much by far. So, the only thing uh, – the thing with, with Drew Brees is I'm totally out on Drew Brees. I know I called Tom Brady new alarm, but Drew Brees takes that to considerably the next level. Uh the, yeah, uh, the Combinator brings a good point. He's talking about Phillip Rivers in Indianapolis. I don't know if it's enough to challenge an AFC, but they will definitely be a playoff team. I think the Texans drop out. We'll talk about AFC for a second. But San Francisco, there's no reason why they can't go back to the Super Bowl. Uh, the Seahawks could also just walk into the Super Bowl as well. I, I forgot think. about them, yeah. Yeah, so they're definitely I'm – out, I'm out on the Packers. I don't think they have enough weapons. I think it's going to be the same situation as last year. Obviously, a nice regular season that just gets tormented uh, when you talk about, um, you know, the playoffs. Like, they, like if they played San Francisco again, there's no reason it wouldn't be the same exact game. Uh, yeah, and look, I, I think Rivers uh, in Indianapolis could be good for this year. Um, I think he's, he's going to have the best offensive line he's had in quite some time. And they drafted uh, Michael Pippen Jr. out of USC. He's going to compliment T.Y. Hilton and Jack Doyle at the tight end position. And, and I love their head coach, Frank Reich. I think Indianapolis, like you said, Spence, should be in the mix uh, for that division. And I know the Tominator is a big Jets fan, so uh, we'll give him a little bit of Jets talk here. And, and I hate – Hey, you, you cut out again. Uh, to, to speak on the Jets <laughs> – well, it takes a couple seconds to come back um, – they have the worst offensive line in the NFL, and they also just don't have any weapons. So, and I really, I really feel bad for Sam Darnold to speak on that just for a quick second, because this is kind of a make or break year for him, very similar to Baker. Although I think Sam Darnold has a little more leeway because he hasn't been as well similarly situated offensively. So, okay, uh, Brad, are you back? No, you're not back just yet. So, uh, we will we will uh, wait just a few more moments on that. But yeah, to go back to the Jets, obviously, uh, like I said, Sam Darnold has a little bit of leeway. But again, if he has a really bad season, it's I don't know what that means for the Jets. Do they go after a quarterback in the first round? Gosh, that just feels like an investment that just doesn't feel worth it at all. Uh, I still would give him another season after this because I think there's no way the Jets go, you know, cut anywhere close to uh, five wins. All right, are we are we back? Yep. We're back. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Finally. Okay, now I get to give my Jets rant for the Tominator. Yep. Uh, Tominator, I'm sorry. I think the Jets stink, and I think they got a clown <laughs> and a buffoon as a head coach, Adam Gase, bug-eyed Adam Gase. I think he's a jackass, and this is going to be his last year as a head coach. Uh, Le'Veon Bell, he made a terrible mistake uh, by sitting out. 
his year for Pittsburgh. Uh, one of the worst decisions ever from an NFL player, and he's come back and been mediocre at the position. So he's got to prove it year, and you, you would hope that he will try to prove it. But they lost Robbie Anderson at the receiver position. Uh, so it's kind of an uphill battle. They haven't made any huge splashes on the defensive end in free agency, aside from trading away Jamal Adams. So it's going to be – up to uh, the mono-led Sam Darnold, and we'll see if he can keep his lips off the girls this season and play a full year for the Jets. And if he can, uh, maybe they beat the Dolphins once, but the Jets maybe will win three or four games this year, unfortunately, for the Tominator, as he's a diehard Jets fan. Uh, but the Jets need to kind of revamp that whole front office. They need to get rid of Gase. Uh, they should probably move on and see what kind of value they can get from Le'Veon Bell. Uh, but Sam Darnold at least will be the face – of the Jets franchise for quite some time, but they've got to they've got to rebuild that defense. Hopefully, I'm not really sure who they've got as far as young guys on the defensive side of the ball. I have to do some research on that for the Tominator, but uh, at least they could probably beat the Dolphins and then maybe give the Bills a run. And look, no, uh, not the Bills. The Bills are really good. <laughs> yeah, they're they could uh, make another deep run. The Bills could make a run. They were close I, to beating I, the Texans. I personally think the Patriots are, are right for the picking, so they may they may be able to stay close. But uh, they had some unfortunate quarterback issues last year because when Darnold went down their backup position oh was, was pretty bad so uh, we'll, we'll see and I know there's some Steeler fans out there they start off uh, opening night against the Giants uh, the Giants have some good pieces but I don't know that I agree with the the, the Joe Judge coaching hire we'll see how that turns out I, like I said I do like some of their talent uh, but I'm not high on the Steelers because I just I think Ben Roethlisberger has played his best games long ago uh, we'll see how that translates. Um, I, I do like Mike Mike Tomlin, but I think he does make some clock management poor decisions down the stretch and, and throughout the games. Um, so we'll see if he can get the Steelers to bounce back and compete for that division where it looks like Lamar Jackson and the Ravens have a stranglehold on it. But we'll, we'll see how that shapes out for Pittsburgh. Uh, but, but Spence, we've got to talk. We've got to move into NBA playoffs. As we had a game seven tonight, in the bubble down in Orlando between the Utah Jazz and the Denver Nuggets. Just in a very exciting series. Tonight was not as high scoring as it was hard to really match game six as Jamal Murray went for 50-plus and Donovan Mitchell for 40, and these guys shot the lights out. Today was a little more scoring, but Denver came back. Uh, Utah had that game in hand. Denver came back. They took the lead late, and a crazy series of events down the stretch. I'll let you tell the audience how it shaped up there at the end and uh, your thoughts about Denver moving on. Yeah. Uh, Utah, to talk about them for just a second, who obviously just got eliminated, lost by two points. It was 80 to 78. So that is insane uh, scoreline, especially in modern day. But uh, Donovan Mitchell had a chance to win the game. They had the, they had the last possession and he obviously missed. But Utah was the double surprise of the bubble. They come in as looking like literally one of the worst teams to come into the bubble. And then they somehow pull this switch. And a lot of that didn't come from Mike Conley and Donovan Mitchell. They were both playing up to par. It was everyone else on the team that was really uh, struggling. So I thought they would only go to six games and uh, Denver would win pretty handily. And somehow they found themselves on the wrong end of a 3-1 uh, deficit uh, lead series. But uh, I think... Denver really settled in. I think they realized they're a more talented team, locked in defensively a lot more. Uh, but I get, and they're so lucky. I think uh, you know Denver's going to be playing Clippers in the next round, and Jokic is probably going to get away with his uh, you know immense size difference. But I think if you play someone like the Lakers, where it gets a lot more physical, and you start playing guys like Anthony Davis, that's when Denver is just going to fall apart at the seams. Well, look, in, in this in the Denver series against the Clippers, there's no reason Jokic shouldn't have his way uh, with Zubats for the Clippers. Uh, the Clippers are a really deep team, but here's the thing with Denver, and, and we talk about some of these young superstars in the league. Jamal Murray has the potential to do what he did through three games where he was 40-plus points. We've seen flashes of that last year's playoffs. If he can have moments like that, he can single-handedly, along with Jokic and some of those role players, bring Denver a few wins here. I don't think this is going to be a slam dunk series where the Clippers just run away with it. I, I think Denver has a chance to take this game deep, this series deep. And look, if it weren't if it weren't for injury of Porzingis, you can easily say that that Dallas series would have been different. Game one with Porzingis being ejected and then him missing the last two to three games of that series really flipped around. Porzingis 
when he's healthy, he's a star. He's a fantastic player, and it was a big loss having him. And, look, Doncic wasn't necessarily 100% with his ankle injury. So I don't think the Clippers are are automatically walking into the Western Conference Finals, Spence. Yeah, I mean, they look shaky against Dallas, a team that they should not have. And obviously they clean it up, but again, a lot of that does come from Porzingis not being there, which is a very long-term problem for Dallas. So that's a discussion for another time. But, you know, Zubats is ultimately going to have to guard, um, you know, the center position. And I think Montrez Harrell obviously trade off on that a bit, which is probably a much better matchup for them. Uh, ultimately, you know, we'll pass. Better be able to guard Jamal Murray, probably. And I think the, the biggest matchup problem comes from uh, Jeremy Grant guarding Kawhi Leonard. I, I know Jeremy Grant's athletic and everything like that. I just don't f- think physically his matchup is fantastic. I think he's going to get bullied quite a bit. And like last series, it's going to come down to playoff PG, the self proclaimed. If he has a bad game and Jamal Murray has a really good game, I think that's where Denver's going to steal games. Because you know, Jokic is probably going to average like 25, 10, and 10 in this series. I think that's. Uh, pretty much a given unless he just really falls apart which would be really surprising game one in the eastern conference semifinals the number one seed milwaukee bucks and the miami heat and jimmy butler had a career high playoff high 40 points and he was outstanding in game one for the miami heat as they upset the milwaukee bucks uh did the heat have a chance in this series against milwaukee we've seen milwaukee stumble in game one in the opening round series against the orlando magic uh, they've stumbled here against the Heat. I think they can get back on track, but certainly Miami, uh, with the way they can shoot the ball and, and Jimmy Butler, his ability to do things on both ends of the court, offensively and defensively, definitely give the Miami Heat a shot in this series against Milwaukee. What are your thoughts after game one, the Heat against the Bucks? Yeah, so the thing is with Milwaukee is I just – doesn't feel like there's another notch for them they kind of play at an eight like in the regular season and they've played on that eight through the playoffs and you need that to be a 10 or at least a nine and a half and I've talked about this numerous times is Giannis the future of the league not yet for me we know how athletic he is obviously it's freakish for him to be a seven as tall as he is at, like basically a center who can play at the guard position the problem comes just like what Philly did to him just like what Toronto does to him You put him in the half court and you say, okay, you got to get a half court bucket. And in the fourth quarter of that game, he had three points and two turnovers off of like one of four shooting. He, he doesn't have the juice and I, it's an intangible. And I know I'm a very statistically driven analyst, but there is something in the game that I call the juice. It's that extra level. It's that ability to play up in the most important moments and maybe not even making the shot in the most important moments, but to be there, to be present, to be active, and I just don't see that from him. And you talk about the other side, Jimmy Butler. He's not as talented as Giannis, but he has the juice. And you saw that yeah, in the last two minutes of the game. Juice. Yeah, yeah so that was the difference in game one. He absolutely has the juice. I couldn't agree with you any more on that. He's just – there's just like you said, those guys that have that juice, that extra gear that they could turn it in late in the game. I think Jamal Murray's shown he has that. Uh, Kawhi Leonard, even though he's kind of a mute robot, he does have that. Um Jimmy Butler clearly has it, and, and and if they can get their shooters going and complement with but- Butler, and we've seen Dragic. Dragic has played great. Growing Dragic, point guard for Miami. Look, they're, they're live in this series. And uh, if you want to make a little coin here in Las Vegas, uh, Miami may, may be a way, way to go. Uh, they still may be an underdog in this series, but you can get, get a little bit of value uh, taking the heat, and I think they got a good chance. And look, uh, another series today where the underdog has came through twice, uh, in this series in the Eastern Conference, Toronto, Boston, Boston got a 102 99 victory today. Uh, you were telling me Jason Tatum went for 30 plus. This Boston team has got some skilled playmakers with Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and Kemba Walker. And they've got a couple guys in the middle that can protect the rim. Looks like they've got a stranglehold on this series, Spence 2 0. And as we've seen, Toronto not miss a beat without Kawhi Leonard up to this point. You look at the comparison. No Kawhi Leonard for Toronto. They're down 2-0. No no Kyrie Irving for the Celtics, and they look great. Yeah, and the the thing that I want to talk about is they're obviously the most well-coached team in the league. I think that goes without say. But you have your two-guard position, which is your two best players. I don't think Siakam's even there yet, in my opinion. He's supposed to be, but he's a player that has, I think, defensive juice, but on offensively just doesn't have the repertoire needed, Uh, especially when you don't have the space that Kawhi Leonard brings. 
So you're depending on Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet, obviously. These are two guys who don't shoot very well, if you can believe that. It's kind of like a surprising statistic, so I looked it up. Uh, Kyle Lowry in the regular season only shot 41.6% overall field goal percentage. Fred Van Fleet similarly only shoots 41.3%. And if you guys want a metric to kind of compare that to uh, in terms of overall field goal percentage, Jamal Murray in the regular season, 45.6% field goal percentage. Uh, and I, I had, um, shoot, I also had um, Damian Lillard. He, he shoots like 46.7%. So obviously... Um, you know, <laughs> they're like you're depending on at least one of them to have a good shooting night. So I don't think their overall field goal percentage is indicative of their nightly performance. I think just sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off, and you can't afford that in the playoffs, especially if you don't have Kawhi Leonard. Is this series over for Toronto? Do you see a way they can get back in this series, or is the matchup bad for them with Jalen Brown able to match up defensively and kind of take away uh, some of their best players and their best shooters? Is this done for Toronto? Are they done? Is this a bad matchup for them? I don't think it's over. Like, I don't think they're going to sweep them or anything. That would be like crazy in my opinion. But I think the Celtics have this pretty much in hand because you got a guy in Jason Tatum who can get his own shot at any point. And quite frankly, Toronto just doesn't, not efficiently at least. Although we know Jason Tatum can have those really bad games. So it depends on if he has one of those in the series, whether, and that would tip, you know, the favor in Toronto's. But I don't, I don't know. Tatum is one of those really interesting players that I just can't get a effective read on. He is. He is very interesting, and, and it's going to be it's going to be challenged. Look, Nick, Nick Nurse won Coach of the Year. Uh, this team's got a lot of grit. They're they are a championship team, so I don't expect them to go away without a fight. And look, we just seen it in the opening series um, with uh, with Denver and Utah. Denver was down three to one, and they stormed back and they won the series in seven games. So it's not over till it's over. Um, so we'll kind of monitor that. But Spence to to finish up. The NBA talk. I want to talk about um, some of the young guys in the league and who are some of your your brightest stars that have maybe been in the league five years or less. Damian Lillard's still a young guy, but he's kind of a veteran um, in this league, so I'm not going to include him in that category. Uh, like I said, five years or less less in the league. I'm going to give you my top three in random order. Uh, Devin Booker for me, one of my favorites. Uh, after this series by Luca, I'm going to include Luca in there. And I don't know if it's uh, recency biased with what I've just seen recently. Um, but, man, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to throw Jamal Murray as my third if he can be healthy. I think these guys are fantastic young players. There's tons of guys that I didn't name, uh, but these three stick out for me. Uh, you, you've got an affiliation with uh, the Grizzlies. Is John Morant in your, in your list? Who is your top three young NBA stars moving forward five years or less in the league at this point, Spence? Luca is definitely number one without a doubt. And I would like to say Devin Booker. I really would, but he's this is the first season he's ever won more than 24 games. And I would definitely say he hasn't had the worst teammates around him. At least comparatively, you're talking about let's talk about the Wizards. I mean, they, a team that's made the playoffs consistently. Have the Phoenix Suns really had a worse team than the Wizards? So I'm not ready to say John ja Morant either. I'm not ready to say Zion. Honestly, I would lean more towards Tatum or Brandon Ingram. I would let one of them take that spot. I really like Ingram, and he won Most Improved Player of the Year, obviously. Basically increased every stat line he has possible. He's a guy who just like has that moniker about him, that nastiness that you really need, and a guy who can make literally any shot on the court from any location uh, reasonably well. So, honestly, I do want to slide him up there. Uh, yeah, that's Tell me two. who your second one was again. So I honestly, you got Luca. I'm going to put Tatum there, but Brandon Ingram is somewhere close to my heart. Uh, yeah, I gosh. think he just won most improved player. Isn't that he right? Did. He Brandon did. Ingram? He did. So, um, gosh, I don't know. Trey Young, maybe you want to put that there. Are you, would you be willing to do that? I mean, the guy is putting up. Yeah, the same I, I, I think, I, I think Trey Young, absolutely. I know, I know Atlanta has the track record similar to, to Phoenix as far as not winning much, but man, Trey Young is absolutely a superstar in the making. Uh, so to leave him off that list is tough. So is that your third Trey Young for the Atlanta Hawks? I think I am. And I, I think that's yeah. a great pick, man. Steven, thanks for checking in. Uh, I know sports isn't your favorite topic to uh, discuss with football, but uh, you know, if there's anything on your mind, feel free to chime in. And I appreciate you checking in. Uh, here at the rest stop, we come to you live every Tuesday and Thursday here on twitch.tv slash 
Chris Landry football, 9 to 10 Pacific time, live Tuesday and Thursday. If you miss any part of the show live, you can go back and listen to the audio version on any of the podcast platforms. All you have to do is search Landry football conference call and right underneath there, you can find the rest stop and you can check out any of the podcast forms, Spotify, iTunes, Audio Boom, anywhere to check that out. You can follow us on social media, Spencer at Spencer the Wiz, myself on Twitter at Brad the Believer and on Instagram at Brad the Believer. Anything that you want to chime in about, uh, feel free to check in. Steven, I love you, man. Thanks for the check-in. Appreciate that. Uh, as you can see, Steven's avatar there, I'm going to give him a little plug. Steven is an extremely talented artist, and he's he's into the drawing and the anime you'll see there. He is uh, extremely talented. So if you want any cool drawings, uh, I'm giving a shout-out to Steven. I'm going to be hitting him up. He's one of the more talented uh, uh, artistry guys, and he, he builds games as well, video games. Uh, different sounds and characters, extremely talented individual. Stefan Henry, thank you for checking in, my friend. So uh, we hit NBA, Spence. Uh, we hit a little bit of NFL. Uh, but I want to go to one of our segments here, and we hit it last week. It's called Last Chance, No Chance. Hit it, Spence. All right, this is where we talk about people in the pop culture, sporting, or political world, and we'll see if they deserve a chance, second chance at redemption, or if they have no chance. We'll start it off with Antonio Brown because we're two weeks away from the start of the NFL season 2020. Antonio Brown is still without a team. He has been in and out of the news over the last year because of his antics off the field and he can't stay at a team on the field here in Las Vegas. He was with the Raiders last offseason, but didn't even play one game. And the NFL has put down an eight game suspension. So the question is one more chance, Spence, or last chance, uh, or I, I should say no chance or one more chance, last chance. I'm going to say, even though I don't agree with this at all, he's got one more chance, one more chance because of his talent. Just and give I think. Me a chance. Did you give him a chance? My favorite soundbite. But I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna get another shot. Uh, after his suspension, he's just got too much talent not to kick the tires one more time for Antonio Brown. And I don't agree with it. I think he played himself out of a job. Not played himself. He talked himself and acted himself out of a job last year with his on the off the field antics, his Instagram live videos. We haven't heard much from him in the last couple of weeks, but the last we did hear from him, he said he's retired. He wants back in. He doesn't want back in. I don't know what to think of this guy. He's all over the place. He stayed silent here the last month, uh, but once he gets it going again, it's just a matter of time. Uh, I think he's going to be more of a distraction. So as much as I want to say no chance, I think somebody's going to give him another chance. Your thoughts, Antonio Brown, does he get another chance this year, 2020? I say he does not have a chance. And the reason I say it is this. He's so talented. We saw this with the Raiders. He's so talented that you have to game plan around him. You basically change your whole offensive book to get him looks. That's the whole point. Because first of all, if he doesn't get looks, you know he's going to complain, going to go to the media, cry, cry, cry. So you have to put so much investment into it. And now you don't even know if he's going to stay on the team for more than two weeks. So we saw that with the Raiders. You see that with the Patriots where you have like this two week window before the next thing comes up. I just think it would be crazy for any GM to make that kind of investment. It's uh, he's not someone you can just take, pick up and plug in like does like even like a problem person like does Bryant, you know, it's not going to come to the issue. Well, if I don't know if he's going to be on the team for the rest of the year, they have a couple of headlines that you're not too favorable of if you're a GM, but still it would never be to this level. I'm with you. I, I agree. I don't think he, he should have another chance, but I just foresee, especially with this preseason less season, I see injuries happening and I see a team that feels like with this expanded playoff setup that they have a chance to get in the playoffs and they may be an Antonio Brown away from making that appearance. That's why I feel after this eight game suspension, somebody's going to give him another shot. Spence, a guy we haven't heard from in quite some time. I'm going to throw into this list for this episode. Johnny Manziel, and it's for the fact that we're only two weeks away from the start of the NFL season, and Johnny football has not been in the news. He's saying his football career is done. It didn't last long, so it may be an easy one, 
But with this pandemic shortened season, we may see more injuries than we've ever seen. And does a team get desperate and bring in this guy? I mean, we haven't bring in uh, no Kaepernick. Uh, so is Johnny Manziel even on the radar? He didn't even play in the XFL. So I'm saying his football career is done. Hit it with a no chance, Spence, for Johnny football. No chance. That's what you got. <laughs> I mean, no I, I would say this is probably unanimous. Johnny Manziel, chance. Last chance, no chance, Spence. He's my favorite college football player of all time, so I wish he did get nice. another chance. I actually – I can tell you, in the middle of important 400-level accounting classes, I have watched Montreal Canadian football games where Johnny Manziel played and also the Memphis games uh, when he had his short stint there. So I, I keep up with his career quite closely. Not as much as I used to, but when he was playing in, in Canada, I, I watched every single game. He's just really fun. You just never know what's going to happen. Uh, I think the last concussion he had, which I believe was in Montreal, where he was going for the goal line, that was like his career entering injury, even though it wasn't technically, uh, that was just deadly to me. Do you think if he committed to football and wanted another chance, do you think that uh, he could put himself in a position to maybe get a look from another team? It would depend on the, on the injury. You would need a team. I don't know, like Baltimore or something like that. A team that has a lot of like running involved in it. He's not going to fit in in traditional offense as we know that. He wouldn't play for the Jaguars. Uh, you know, the Bengals situation is already good. I'm just trying to go around thinking who are the most mobile teams. Maybe the Chargers, but they even have two really like decent quarterbacks, Tyrod Taylor and obviously the kid they drafted. So that would technically be one of the best places for him to be, but there's just no spot for him. Uh, yeah, yeah no, no chance. <laughs> tough, tough for Johnny Manziel to get back in the mix. Uh, we're going to bring in an actress into our uh, last spot. She made the cut here for no chance, last chance, the incomparable Roseanne Barr, ladies and gentlemen, as Meet the Connors is coming back for another season, but without Roseanne Barr. And even within all of this uh, civil unrest, she has made some comments, uh, racially insinuated comments, and they've taken her off ABC, and we have not really heard from her in many months, but she's so talented. She's so funny. I've got to think that at some point she's going to get one more chance. So let's give her one more chance here. Spence. <laughs> okay. We'll give it. Just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. What about my uncle? Did you give him a chance? Uh, <laughs> I say there's no way <laughs> I have to disagree with you. It's just the, uh, the political climate and there, <laughs> there's no such thing. It feels like as a redemption story, unless it's like a really special circumstance, there's just people will blackball you from existence if they do not like you on social media. Yeah. Look, I, I, it's tough. It's tough in this landscape to, um, to, to find uh, a place. Once you've kind of done something like this, you would, you would hope or think that, I mean, someone like Roseanne Barr has probably had multiple chances. Um, I think she's super talented and I'm hoping she gets one more chance. That's me selfishly. Um, but in this landscape, it, it may be a challenge. Uh, I was hoping that you could pull her national anthem um, singing there, Spence. Uh, I don't know if you have that uh, close by. but I, I can definitely pull it up. <laughs> well, she's she's famous for her rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, Old Glory, at one of the baseball games. And I was hoping to get uh, a one off of, of her performance in that as we are as me personally, I'm rooting I'll, for her to get one. I more will chance. pull it up. Give me uh, one sec. <laughs> but look, uh, it's going to be tough for Roseanne Barr to get back in. Like she's one in my opinion, she's one of the great uh, television sitcom actors as, as the Connors, you know, uh, I forget. The, I don't know why I'm agreeing. Agreeing. I can't remember the name of the show. It, it wasn't the Connors back then. It, there was another name uh, that I'm missing. Uh, but a great show in the '90s that she she was a part of is now turned into the Connors. As Spence is trying to pull this up for us. Shall, here. shall we? Are you ready to play this? Go, you, go for this it. Is what you're talking about, right? Okay. Yes. San Diego Padres. Here she is. The incomparable Roseanne Barr. How big can you see by the times early life? What's so proudly we have that the twilight glass gleaming? I know Stephen had a comment there. Stephen, what do you think about this performance? Do you, do you think you could do better? 
That's right. I don't know why it slipped my mind. Oh, she's, she's going, really going, she's going ballistic it. right there. <laughs> Steven's loving it. I can see it. I can see him dancing in the background. We haven't seen this since uh, the All Star game for the NBA. In terms of a famous, uh, you know, national anthem rendition. Very patriotic. <laughs> the people talking in the background, which is the funniest part. <laughs> <laughs> Steven's cat is howling like a dog. I don't. I don't... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so Amazing. I apologize for anybody that just jumped in and heard that, but we were doing last chance, no chance, and uh, we were questioning if Roseanne Barr had another chance to get back into the acting world and grace us with her acting and comedic prowess on the te television set. So I had to get Spence to come up and play her great rendition of the national anthem. So I apologize uh, to Sarah Stevens cat if uh, her ears are <laughs> ringing there from that, but we'll, uh, we'll get some more uh, melody for her on the next show. So tune in, make sure you tune in Thursday and every Tuesday and Thursday, nine to 10 o'clock. Pacific time as uh, we're going to bring uh, another new segment for you next week, uh, or actually I should say Thursday um, as I'm going to try to get something together in, in case you missed it. I'll give a little tease to that. We're going to have an animal that has a great sporting talent and we're going to bring that to you on Thursday. And then also in case you missed it, we're going to kind of commentate something that you may have missed on reality television that caught my eye. So we'll hit that on Thursday. And I want to thank Steven and the Tominator and everybody that checked in from Facebook Live and on Periscope. Uh, this is The Rest Stop. I am Brad Restituto. That's Spencer The Wiz. Make sure you check us out every Tuesday and Thursday here live on Landry uh, TV on twitch.tv slash Landry Football. And of course, you can visit us on our uh, conference, Landry conference call on any of the podcasting platforms. I'm Brad the Believer. That's Spencer the Wiz. Uh, thanks for checking in. You're a little late, Vic, uh, but we'll be back Thursday live. The rest of us.